Thank you. We are now recording. Okay. Let's see now. Welcome to the Alamos History Association. Today, I'm talking about the Almadas and Alamos, focusing on Antonio and Jose Maria with the dates of 1783 to 1866. In Alamos, the large building overlooking the plaza on the west, containing Los Portales and the Terracotta restaurant, was built by Jose Maria Almada, who lived from 1791 to 1866. The Almadas were important political and economic actors in the municipality, and their presence continues to be felt. My information about the Almadas comes from a book by an Almada descendant, Albert Stagg. The Almadas and Alamos, 1783-1867, published by the University of Arizona Press in, seven, in 1978. Stagg's mother was an Almada, and he carried out wide-ranging research in writing this book, including talking with Lavon Alcorn, whose widow is the present owner of Los Portales. In 1783, newly appointed Bishop de los Reyes arrived in Alamos with two nephews, Antonio Almada and his brother, Father Jose Almada. The bishop had previously been a Franciscan missionary in Sonora. The bishop and his nephews were Spanish, but the Almadas originally were based in Portugal. The name Almada comes from a Portuguese town across the Tagus River from Lisbon. Almadein means mine in Arabic. The earliest known Almada ancestor was a feudal lord named Sayer from Lincolnshire, one of four English commanders of a contingent with the Second Crusade in 1147. The Lord was awarded land by the King of Portugal for his assistance in conquering Lisbon from the Moors. Sayer donated his holdings in England to the church and settled in Portugal, taking the name of Almada. In the 15th century, an Almada president, predecessor, Alvaro, was active politically in both England and France and was close to the ruling family of Portugal. Choosing the losing side in a battle, however, Alvaro lost his head and the king confiscated his lands and possessions. In the 17th century, Almadas, Almadas had recovered sufficiently to be active again in Portuguese affairs. At the end of the century, though, an Almada son decided to seek his fortune in Spain, where his family had aristocratic connections. Taking the Spanish name Antonio, he married and started the line of Spanish Almadas. Antonio's grandson, Josef, married a Reyes woman whose brother became the Bishop de los Reyes. He who brought his sister's two oldest sons to Alamos in 1783. Shortly after his arrival, Antonia Almada met Luz de Alvarado, an orphan and a great heiress. She was also the niece of one of the most prominent men in Alamos, Bartolome Salido. 
Bartolome was the royal treasurer in Alamos. Luz owned a vast hacienda and two rich silver mines. Her father had been a, the royal treasurer before he died, and her mother came from a prominent family in Sonora. So marriage to Luz would give Antonio entree into the closed circle of Alamo society. On the other hand, Antonio, having been born and educated in Spain, had high status in colonial social ranking. Luz and Antonio married in 1784, and Luz gave birth to four boys between 1785 and 1791. Antonio had been educated as a minor at a mining school in Spain. <clears throat> the idea for this education originated from the bishop who had decided that there was great mineral wealth in Sonora when he served there as missionary. Antonio was trained in a technique called amalgamation, which was not well known in Sonora and which rendered mines more productive in silver ore. Shortly after the birth of his fourth son, Antonio bought his brother-in-law's interests in Luce's silver mines and the great hacienda. Then he bought the rich Balbanera mine in La Aduana and then mines in Yecola. He had become the largest mine owner in Sonora. When Antonio Almada died in, 10, in 1810, his four sons inherited his mines, the richest in Sonora. Bartolome Salido, their great uncle and the executor of Antonio's estate, advised the brothers to pool their resources and continue operating the mines under joint partnership. Silver mining was a constant gamble since loads were unpredictable. A vein of high grade ore might suddenly thin down to quartz or pinch out at a fault. Toledo quoted a Spanish saying, to work a mine requires a mine. The brothers accepted his advice, and he managed their minds during his lifetime. Bartolome was widely recognized as the leader of the community in Alamos. Among other projects, he secured the completion of much of the church begun by Bishop de los Reyes. After his death, the Almada brothers formed a partnership named La Union, each contributing a substantial sum in working capital. The youngest brother, Jose Maria, was appointed manager. The other three of the four brothers had learned practical mining and the essentials of mining operations after secondary school, but the one with the most inquisitive mind, always wanting to know about costs and profit margins, was Jose Maria. After Mexico gained independence from Spain in 1821, silver mining went into a slump. The price of mercury rose from $90 to $260 per quintal, and credit facilities were withdrawn. However, thanks to their partnership and Jose Maria's managerial skills, the Almada mines continued to prosper. A British naval officer wrote in 1826 about his visit to Alamos, quote, 
The mind of the four Almadas, La Balbanera, is next to that of Kosala, the richest in Mexico. The vein is at least 30 yards wide, half of which is worked. And $60,000 are said to be taken from it monthly. Other mines in La Duana and its vicinity produce about $20,000 more, which makes the total amount of metal extracted monthly to $80,000. Were the Almadas to employ more miners in promontorials, it is thought that double or treble the present amount might be obtained." End quote. Jose Maria was 25 years old when he took charge of the mines. He had been married for three years to his cousin, Isabel Quiroz y Compoy. The Quiroz family motto was Después de Dios, Quiroz. After God comes Quiroz. Isabel and the wife of the third Almada brother, Nacho, vied for the top rung in the Alamo social ladder. Nacho was the most civic-minded of the four brothers and devoted much of his time to municipal affairs. After independence, Alamos was the first town in Sonora to have a municipal council and Nacho was the first president. He served on the council many times and was twice district prefect. The other two brothers, besides Jose Maria, were also elected president of the municipal council. Jose Maria built a large mansion on the west side of the plaza, as I mentioned. It was separated from his brother Nacho's house by the Palomares house and Calle Madero, once called Calle Aurora. The building holding the Boer Center then was built by one of the four Almada brothers. Jose Maria was always seeking good investments. He owned enormous cattle herds and much of the choicest property in Alamos. He bought and sold merchandise and speculated in produce. As early as 1830, extraction began to fall in silver mining in the Alamos area. With lower grade ores, profits were eroding. No new ore bodies had been found in Promontorios or La Aduana. Jose Maria was averse to prospecting in Chihuahua though, for he insisted on personally supervising whatever he owned. Robert was, shopkeeper, tend to your store or sell it. He was fascinated by La Quintera, near Alamos and once the richest mine in Sonora. It had been inoperative since 1806 due to flooding. The owner of La Quintera was the Diocese of Durango. Jose Maria ordered the secret exploration of the mine by his mining experts and engineers. He studied their reports and worked out the costs of bringing it into operation. He decided that such an effort would be an expensive gamble, but decided to go ahead if he could acquire the mine cheaply. Using an agent who kept his identity concealed, Jose Maria made a low bid. After drawn out negotiations, he got ownership of the mine. Two of his brothers were willing to go in with him on a 50-50 basis. It took two years to bring La Quintera back into production, but from 1835 
1842, the returns were great. Some years, Jose Maria's share alone netted him over a million dollars. In 1942, La Quintera ceased to be productive. But the old Almada mine, La Balbanera, was proving well through the discovery of black ores at a depth of 600 feet. We'll now turn to another development involving the Almadas. In 1825, there was the Yaqui uprising. This was a revolt against payment of taxes. The post-colonial constitution of 1824 had changed the status of indigenous peoples from wards of the Spanish crown to citizens of the federal Mexican Republic. Surveying parties arrived to measure and assess tribal lands and towns in order to establish valuation for rural and municipal taxes. One of the Yaqui leaders led a revolt against payment, saying that under these circumstances, the Yaquis should disassociate themselves from the Republic. They were not Mexican, but Yaqui. The uprising started in the fall of 1825. Early in 1826, Jose Maria's ranches near Navajoa were raided with houses burned and livestock stolen. After a raid, on the great Almada Hacienda. Nacho Almada, the prefect of the district, called up the militia commanded by Jose Maria. It was a force of 400 men. All four Almada brothers served as officers. In mid-April, word came that a large party of Indians was moving toward the Alamos area. And Jose Maria and his troops were asked to come to the mining camp Promontorios. Indian lookouts warned the Yaquis at the camp of the approach and they withdrew. A score of houses and stores though were burned down and plundered. Jose Maria was glad to find that the employees of the mine and the Indian workers in the mine were unharmed for the most part. He and two captains from the militia were invited to dine with one family and spend the night. One of the daughters in the family, a lively 12-year-old named Mercedes, made an impression on Jose Maria. The rebellion lasted until the spring of 1827. The Almadas decided from the beginning of the rebellion that in the future they would store the bulk of their silver in their houses in Alamos, where it would be safer than at the mines. It is worth noting that the Yaquis, who worked in the mines, did not choose to side with the rebels. The Almada brothers did not ask them to take arms, but only to remain calm and keep working. One outcome of the raid on Promontorios was that Jose Maria made increasingly frequent visits to the family of Mercedes, where he developed, where he witnessed her development into a lovely 16-year-old brought lavish presents for Mercedes, her sisters and mother. When the girl was about 17, he installed her in one of his haciendas, which he named Las Mercedes. She quickly started producing children, five in number before Jose Maria's wife died in 1840. Jose Maria married Mercedes with what some thought was unseemly haste after the death of Isabel, 
and he proceeded to have their five children made legitimate. Nine more children were born to the couple. Nineteen of Isabel's 21 children survived her. When each came of age, Jose Maria gave him or her $50,000 in cash and a well-stocked ranch. From 1824 to 1831, Sinaloa and Sonora were joined in the state of Occidente. From 1828 to 1831, Alamos was the capital of the state. The city had a population of 7,000 at that time. Jose Maria became governor. During his tenure, he pushed through the state congress a bill which became known as the Almada Law. Indigenous people were to receive title to their land in restitution of what they had lost by force or fraud. In 22 articles of law, the state government was standing forth as the protector of Indian communities and promising to restore to Indians land which had been taken from them illegitimately. It was a complicated piece of legislation which involved protecting community lands. The law was to come into effect one year after publication in the state capital. The Almada law, however, did not accomplish all that Jose Maria intended. The protection promise did not come into effect. Who was the background to the Almada law among the Almadas? Bishop de los Rey had adopted sympathetic attitudes toward indigenous peoples during his years as a Franciscan missionary. His nephews, Antonio and Father Jose, both shared broader views compared to other peninsular-born Spaniards. Father Jose preached continuously in his sermons in Alamos that the rich had an obligation to aid the poor and he ended up devoting himself to running the church school in the town. He insisted that the majority of the students in the school come from poor families. Antonio, from the beginning of his arrival in Mexico, noticed that peninsular-born Spaniards were arrogant toward the Creoles, Spanish descent people born in Mexico. He chose to identify himself with Creoles rather than his own countrymen. This attitude made him enemies of peninsula born Spaniards who were jealous of Antonio as he acquired great wealth. Antonio, according to Albert Stagg, acquired from his Franciscan uncle sympathy for, sympathy for indigenous peoples. His son, Jose Maria, may have been at least partly affected by these influences in the legislation he sponsored to protect Indian communities and Indian rights to land. There were two ideological blocks in Mexican politics at this time. One block was known as the conservatives. The clergy and the army favored that party, which was also composed of landed and professional classes. The conservatives advocated a strong central government and maintenance of the status quo. That meant that Fuero's privileges, which had their roots in the colonial period, would still support the power and status of the clergy, the military, professional and corporate bodies. The liberals, also called Federalists, constituted the other position in Mexican politics. 
They sought lessening the power of the Catholic Church, reduction of its enormous land holdings, and elimination of the privileges, fueros. They also sought most social reforms for the betterment of the underprivileged. The Almadas were liberals. The story of Sonora from the late 1820s to the 1860s, the closing point of our discussion, shows that ideological positions could play a role in deciding which side a member of the elite chose in the conflict. However, powerful elite figures could be dangerous rivals for status and influence such that choosing sides could have more to do with personalities and political equations than political principle. Unfortunately for the Almadas, being liberals did not protect them from the successful attempts of another liberal to extract their wealth and diminish their power. I refer here to General Ignacio Pesquerida, governor of Sonora on four occasions between 1856 and 1875. By the 1830s, the balance of power in Sonora had shifted to the northern part of the state. The Amadas, however, still played important roles in the south. The governor appointed one of the four brothers political prefect of the Alamos district, and Jose Maria was prefect of Salvacion district. Jose Maria was also colonel of the local militia and had the task of maintaining peace in the Mayo and Yaqui regions. The Almanas sided with the liberals in the conflict between two powerful rivals in Sonora, Jose Urrea, Emmanuel Maria Gandara and suffered having a number of their ranch houses burned down, crops destroyed, and cattle stolen. Brother Nacho died in February 1851. And in the 1850s, Jose Maria was the only survivor of the founding Almada's four sons. He divided his time between his big house on La Plaza and Las Mercedes, where his wife continued to reside. When, Merce when Mercedes came to Alamo's shop, she would stay at the Bishop's Palace, where Craig and Sandra Fisher live now. The Almonic brothers had had many children some of whom played important political and economic roles. Nacho had 17 children. Chewy Almada had 10 children by two marriages. Antuka Almada had 14 legitimate children and many others besides. Jose Maria had 33 children, the most outstanding of which was his son, known as Chato, born in 1822. Chato is known for his military exploits and fierce opposition to the liberal General Pescaria. Pescaria attempted to extort money from the Alamos elite after large sums had already been granted to him. He dismissed Chato from his command of a force and ordered the execution of an Almaty youth who had turned against the general and fought for an opposing party. Pescaria went so far as to order in 1861 the arrest and imprisonment of Jose Maria or what appear to have been trumped up charges of involvement in a revolt against the liberal government in Sonora. 
Jose Maria was in his 70s and his health took a turn for the worse while he was lodged in cavalry barracks. He was released with a payment of $10,000 after five months imprisonment. Chato's hatred of Pescaria was so intense that he sided with the party supporting French forces and Maximilian during the attempt to establish the second Mexican empire, the Imperium. In 1866, Chalta was shot and killed while trying to escape Republican forces while crossing the Sea of Cortez. His 16-year-old son and a nephew were executed five days later. Jose Maria died shortly thereafter. Many Almadas and their kinsmen left Alamos during the Maximilian Imperium, and few returned. In 1866, Republican forces attacking Chato's forces had sacked the town, showing particular animus toward the homes of sympathizers with the French cause, including the Almadas. The church on the plaza was stripped bare and left a shell after a huge bonfire was made out of whatever was not carried off. It would seem that those who left Alamos at that time could not bear the thought of trying to reconstruct the former way of life after such losses. 1866 seems to be a turning point in the history of the town. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. I have some questions. Um, if you're muted, you can unmute now and we can ask uh, Pam. Um, I'm really interested. I have read the Almadas in Alamos and loved it, but it's been a little while. Now, the Republicans were primarily conservatives. Well, the Republicans, I think that by the 1860s, the conservative liberal nomenclature had shifted a bit. Right. And now um, those supporting the uh, Imperium would have another designation, but I don't know what that was. The Republicans would be people who did not want Maximilian to become the emperor. Okay. And evidently some of those included um, the liberals like Pesquera. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was, things seem to have shifted. And I know in some readings, they talk about the imperialist, uh, Chato being an imperialist. Well, um, yeah, he, he did support Maximilian and the French and all that. But um, how these things changed and intermingled is something. Well, he that, yeah, yeah but he supported the French and Maximilian because Pesquera was against them. He was mostly trying to get back at Pesquera. It was it was a local conflict and rivalry up there in Sonora. Okay, which was partially motivated by ideological positions, but not completely. Yeah, true. Well, thank you for that. Questions, group? You know, I'm just a little curious. Um, it's just kind of a timeline thing. There was a time when Sonora, when Sonora and Sinaloa were one state. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when did that dissolve and how did that come about? Well, it resolved. It, it, it dissolved in 1831, okay. and it started in I think 1825. No, 24. Um, I don't know the story 
behind okay. why it was curious. formed as a state. Um, but my guess is that one of the reasons why um, it broke down was that by eight by the 1830s, the, the economic interests in Sonora were moving to the north and Alamos was no longer going to be capable of being the capital city of such a large area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, during that 1828 to 1831, there were actually four capitals of this area and Alamos was one of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, during that time, time. yeah, it was yeah. short lived, but at least we have the ruins of the governor's palace uh, left yeah. over. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, other comments uh, there. I, I get so interested in the Almadas because we have not only the wealth, we have the influence in politics. Um, you mm -hmm. know, that came from the family, um, you know, and it, you reminded me so much the fact that uh, Jose Maria uh, wanted to have more social justice than many people at his time. And I had, yeah. forgotten, I had forgotten that, even though it never <laughs> came about. So uh, I really appreciated hearing, hearing this again. I felt sorry for the wives. <laughs> so many now, children. Their, life, their <laughs> lives are pretty circumscribed. I read in, in some of my reading, I read once that as these upper class women got older, they got fatter and fatter and fatter because they never got any exercise. All they did was eat and stay home and compete over their dinners, I guess, and their desserts and their drinks. Yeah, but Isabel died pretty young, didn't she? Um, was it Isabel, the first wife of yeah, she died in 1840. Well, she'd given birth to um, 21 children. So I'm not surprised that she would have been weakened by all that activity. Um, let's see, now, when would she have been born? Jose Maria was born in 91. So he was 49 when his wife died. So I guess she was pretty young. She yeah, probably yeah. would have been younger than he was. Yeah, I think she was five or six years younger. So she was in her early to mid 40s anyway, when she passed away. So yeah, the, there's so it's so fascinating, this history and especially of the family. And sometime I know that Carlos Pratt has done a lot of research and sometime perhaps for our association, uh, we can get him to talk some. I know that Craig has, has uh, heard uh, Carlos talk about the Almadas in Spain or Portugal and, and carry through. So that, that's something in the future that we can have too. But, uh, this, this was wonderful on the family. Well, is there any other discussion here uh, from you guys, questions? And uh, I know in Craig's house, uh, uh, there in Craig and Sandra's house, uh, that was Mercedes place. And, uh, and the second floor, floor, I think you mentioned, maybe you mentioned it, but it's been mentioned that she had to have that second floor uh, put in so that her house would be as uh, uh, fancy anyway as the other house in Alamos. Well, the house across the street, which had two floors. Right, and she had to have it. <laughs> but Craig, what's that story? Craig, you're muted. You're muted, Craig. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. see. Uh, the house across the street belongs to Shayla. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, she looked across the street and she said to her husband, you know, you're the 
president of the Occidental, which was the name of the combined states. And you've got to have uh, equally uh, spacious house. So really what they did was they cut our house in half and went down four feet and they cut the house literally in half to make the second floor. So the ceiling, <laughs> the roof never really changed. Ah. Oh. oh. And that's why it looks the same all the way up to a Dietz place where those big steps are. Mm -hmm. That was the end. And uh, we have just about, uh, I think, two thirds of the house. Uh, the rest of it, there's a brick wall. I don't know who built it. That would be a nice story. Um, that separates our house from what is now a city office and the post office. Mm. And they're still single story. Uh huh. Okay. So the, the, roof, the, the point is the roof lines the same. Uh huh. That is amazing. I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah. anyway. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Craig, for, for any way that. So much history in that block, Craig. <laughs> all that line on Comercio and the whole all block. Block. The whole block belonged to the Almadas. Yeah. Right. And you can see in some of them, the residual um, doors that went between uh, the, the homes, I guess, because of the family just kept uh -huh. expanding. But <clears throat> if you go over right across from Reina's, there's an entrance with a, a, a gate that goes into a narrow corridor. Uh -huh. Okay, that, that and the house that's to its right, as you face it, uh, didn't exist. It does now. It's next to JC and Nicholas's home. Uh -huh. and that was an open area that permitted the horses and carriages to come in the back of this house, and and uh, people could uh, enter the house. So it's it's been chopped up uh, quite a lot over the years. Yeah. Well, I read once that the house belonged. In 1783, the house belonged to Luce Alvarado, and she gave it to the bishop for him to live in. Right. The two across the street is the Bartolome house. And uh, uh, apparently, either the, the man or the woman, Bartolome, um, had a relative that owned one of the big mines. And they died. Now, whether they were killed in a raid or most commonly tuberculosis, I don't know. And when they died, the two nieces moved into the Bartholomew's house. As the nieces got older, I guess the burden of having them there must have increased because Bartholomew built this house in 1774. And the two nieces moved in. When the bishop came up, he stayed across the street at the Bartolome's house for a couple of months before he went to what was to be his see, uh, which was the Occidental and not only that, but it went all the way up to Canada, all the way across the Dakotas and all the way down, including Texas. That was his see, I guess is what the Catholics call it. Mm -hmm. Point is the Bishop lasted in Arispe, is that the how you pronounce it? Arispe. Arispe for a very limited time because he kept getting raid, raided by the Indians and he returned to Alamos and the two nieces gave him this house. Uh -huh. When did he die? Uh, when did Antonio Reyes die? Uh, 1787, he died before uh, the church was done. Right. And so I think it was uh, pretty much 1780. Anyway, 1780s, he died. Yeah. I, I don't really know whether he died in this house or when he was out and about, but uh, 
he's got to be buried someplace in Alamos, I would assume. I heard it was that in the church, under the church. I know well, that's one theory. Yeah, and, it's uh, a theory that I, I can't believe that a bishop, the first bishop, isn't recognized. Yeah, yeah. You know, with a gravesite somehow, <laughs> but he's not. That's true. I, you know, you mentioned that he went to a Bay and came back. Uh, if you've been to a Bay, and I've been there many times, I think. He went to a Bay and looked around and said, hey, there's nothing happening here. I'm going back to Alamos. Uh, yeah. they, the, got, the they got is, parties there. You know. yeah, the nieces just gave him the house. Yeah. Okay. And they got married and, of course, had their own. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. Well, are, are, is there, are there more comments uh, from all of you? And, uh, you know, if, if not, Pam, thank you for this. And it brings back, I've read some of it, but this really puts it all in perspective again for me. So I appreciate so much you doing it. And next week, our lesson is going to be about abandoned. So we're going from the uh, sublime to the ridiculous here or something, and uh, Joaquin Murrieta. And, um, you know, I don't know if. We have on our website some information about him, but, uh, but I think um, this is gonna be interesting and I'm working on it right now, but uh, we have our own Sonoran bandit who has an almost connection because he was baptized here. Uh, oh. you know, the Catholics baptized those bands. And also it was a bandit who was not in politics. Now that makes it unusual too, so. Uh, I hope you'll uh, tune in next Thursday, uh, you know, on, uh, what is that, March 3rd, uh, for our next presentation. And then Pam has uh, the next two, and I'm looking forward to those, Pam, and uh, coming up. So anyway, we've, uh, we've got a, a good month left, and I thank all of you for joining us today. And uh, we'll just go ahead and sign off unless anyone's got a last word. <laughs> well, Thanks, Pam. Okay, goodbye thank to you. all of you and thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye.